method, types of antennas, single port measurements, and two port measurements. So first thing is where are antennas used? And antennas are used anywhere there is a transmission or reception of a radio. And we'll find these in satellite communications, terrestrial communications, radar, and sonar. Antennas are reciprocal devices, so they're operating in both directions equally efficiently. So radio waves, uh, very quickly as a review, a uh, radio wave is a magnetic field at a right angle to an electrical field. Both fields travel oscillating together and are perpendicular to each other. These electromagnetic fields uh, travel at the speed of light in free space, and our understanding of these are based on Maxwell's equations. So some terms we need to know about antennas uh, if we're going to perform measurements. Polarization is the or orientation of an antenna to the Earth. A vertical polarization is when the antenna's electrical field is vertical to the Earth's surface. Horizontal polarization is when an antenna's electrical field is horizontal to the Earth's surface. And then we have near fields and far fields. Near field uh, antennas um, are very close and they're generally a couple of wavelengths of the operating frequency um, to a near field antenna. And an example of that is RFID when you use your credit card uh, to swipe over a scanner to pay. And then far fields are further away from an antenna, usually at least 10 wavelengths of the operating frequency from the antenna. And those are most common um, that we see today. The other subject uh, to talk about when thinking of antennas are antenna gain. And antenna uh, has gain, and you can find that gain in the technical data sheet from the manufacturer. And depending on the type of antenna design, there can be more than 50 dBi of gain, and those are generally parabolic large satellite antennas that have that much gain to them. Um, others, more general uh, antennas, they'll have about 20 dBi of gain. And we achieve that gain by utilizing elements on the antenna, and the elements direct the energy in a specific direction. Uh, when we talk about I in DBI, that stands for isotropic, and isotropic antenna is a perfect ideal antenna. And if you would imagine that uh, you had an orb that emitted energy in every direction equally, uh, that would represent a theoretical isotropic antenna. But because uh, no antenna actually really operates in that fashion, um, we, we have directional antennas. Uh, so a good way to think about that is if you can imagine a light bulb that shined in every direction equally, um, it would propagate all of that energy that would have no gain whatsoever. But if you took a mirror and angled the mirror at 45 degree angles, the light would shine more brightly in the direction of that 45 degree. That's the same concept for antennas. That's how uh, antennas have gain. There are a lot of different types of antennas, uh, isotropic, dipole, monopole, of array, phased array antennas. Uh, those are utilized primarily for beam forming. And uh, there's quite a few interesting advances in chips um, where the chipset can uh, adjust the phase of the signal and um, create a beam. And that's in a lot of 5G technology and things like that that are coming forward. Conical antennas are used in satellite applications and point to point. They're also beamforming. And then we have aperture, which are waveguide 
horn antennas. Uh, you'll see those a lot of different applications. So here's an example of a two-port uh, antenna application. Uh, in this case, this is a radar cross-section um, measurement that's being performed on one of our handheld uh, VNA masters. And then here are some other examples of where antennas are. We have uh, cellular communications, military aerospace, medical telemetry, land mobile radio, um, first responder radio, radios, uh, of course, AM, FM broadcast, uh, WLAN, those types of things. And as you can see uh, from the ship, there are many, many antennas in the base station that you can see a gentleman climbing on, uh, many, many antennas on that mast. And when we talk about antennas, we have to measure across the entire spectrum, and uh, we can do that with different models of ANRITSU vector network analyzers. Uh, whether they be benchtop, they can go up to terahertz range. And we also have handhelds. Uh, very common in cellular uh, base station maintenance, uh, where the cables and antennas are measured as well. So first thing we have to do in order to measure an antenna's performance is determine uh, the specifications from the technical data sheet, and that is going to tell us what the stop uh, start frequency is, what the stop frequency is that the antenna is designed to operate in. And then we're going to choose the number of data points and I of bandwidth, and we'll set up the traces for our desired measurements. Of course, when we uh, set up the VNA, we're going to have to perform a calibration to establish our ratio. And in this case, uh, we'll use an SOLT method. The antenna that I'm using today is a 3.5 millimeter connector. So these are the common types of calibration. Um, there's many different types. Obviously, uh, if you have aperture where it's waveguide, that type, um, you might utilize a plate, um, a reflection plate, things like that. But there are many different ways uh, to, to perform a calibration. And just as a refresher, um, so that we understand what our S parameters mean. S21 is our forward transmission, S12 is reverse transmission, S11 is our forward reflection, and S22 is our reverse reflection. And here's some definitions if you actually want to understand uh, how the VNA is performing the math for the ratio, uh, you can look at all of these as well. And we have our Smith chart, which is very important in order to uh, measure our S11. We're always going to be looking for a match in the center of the Smith chart at the operating range of the antenna. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, here I'm going to show some examples of how to set up the VNA. Um, this is on a shock line series vector network analyzer from ANRITSU. And we have our start frequency of 3 megahertz, our stop at 3 gig, number of data points chosen is 1,000. And we're going to set up our traces. You can set up uh, as many traces, up to 16 traces uh, with different parameters on there. Uh, in this case today, we're set up four. And under display, uh, we can change that trace format and change the measurement to what we like. And under calibration, that's where we're going to set up our cal. We're going to do a manual calibration. Oops, sorry. And we're going to do a one port. And this is where we can modify the cal setup and then, of course, when we select uh, port one devices, uh, we're going to calibrate, um, connect our open. And once the open is measured, 
you'll see a checkbox uh, once that device is measured. And then we connect to short and select short when it's finished. Again, you'll get the green checkbox right there. And then we have to connect our load. Uh, once our load is finished, again, we get the green checkbox. After that, we click done and the calibration is applied and we connect our device and can perform a measurement. And that could be in frequency domain, uh, time domain. Uh, you can look at SWER or Smith chart or whichever you really need to measure. We also have time gating in time domain. And you can measure the length of cables, obviously, that are connected to the antenna that are on the tower or measure different devices. Uh, in this case, we're just looking at an open. Then, of course, um, there are times when uh, you may want to have a 3D representation of your antenna, and that is achieved with a vector network analyzer as well. And what happens is you have the antenna in a fixed position, and most of the time you have a robotic arm uh, within a chamber, and that robotic arm will travel to different coordinates in a circle uh, entirely around the antenna. And what it'll do is it'll save an S2P file for each position. And then once the robotic arm is finished uh, covering all the coordinates, those S2P files um, are used to calculate uh, a 3D representation of the energy uh, surrounding a antenna. And in this case, it's a half-wave dipole antenna, uh, and that's going to give you um, a donut-shaped uh, representation in 3D. And now we will um, pause for a second, and we'll take any questions, and I'm going to switch over to the VNA. Great. Okay, go ahead. I'll let you type your question in there. Let's see. I guess that he has a question, so go ahead. I'll give him a second here. Oh, okay. You ready? The calibration is always in the SOL order. Yes. Uh, you should always follow the SOL order um, on any VNA. Uh, most of the time it won't have any impact, um, but just organizationally, um, it's always uh, best to follow uh, the instructions on the VNA. In our case, uh, you're always going to find that the VNA, regardless of the VNA type uh, product that it is, it's always going to be open, short, load and then the through and of course if you're doing a two port you always want to characterize the through um, being reciprocal or you want to know the exact electrical length um, in picoseconds or millimeters so yeah. okay i do have another question for you actually they're coming Great. in now so um is the bw of the antenna the same as the band between the start and the stop frequencies Yes, that's what you would set uh, your bandwidth, the bandwidth of, ant of the antenna. Every antenna is designed to operate in specific, specific bands, uh, specific start-stop frequencies. Um, if you think of them, they're, uh, the way that they're designed, they're sort of um, help you in, they act as a filter, if you would, um, so the bandwidth is, is always the start uh, frequency and then the stop frequency of, of the antenna. <clears throat> okay, the next question is, for an antenna mount um, on a tower, how can you eliminate 
the effects of receiving signals during antenna measurement with the VNA? Uh, you can't. You would have to put the antenna in an isolation chamber. Um, and so you really don't have that opportunity. Okay. Can you just leave the port open or do you need to use a calibrated open and short? You always have to use um, an open. You can't leave it open air. And the reason why you can't do that is uh, a precision open from a calibration kit um, that is designed to operate uh, in a 50 ohm network. And if you leave the port just open to air, it actually sees uh, approximately 376 ohms, I believe, open to air. So it's not a correct match. And if you remember the Smith chart that we looked at, um, we're always interested in having a precision match. That is what establishes the ratio um, that allows the VNA to make accurate measurements. <clears throat> How far the antenna be placed? Is the measurement uh, needs to be done in a shield room? How, how about open space measurements? So uh, I guess that person is probably doing material measurements, which are very common to port uh, antenna measurement for a VNA, um, where you have two antennas and you uh, calibrate generally with a reflection plate in the center. And um, you have uh, both ports then, um, once the VNA is calibrated, can measure the material and determine the propagation velocity and dielectric constant of the material. Um, the length that the two antennas should be separated at, in general, um, you, you want to have, if it's a far field antenna, you want to have about 10 wavelengths uh, away from both antennas. So it's dependent on the operating frequency that you're utilizing. Obviously, very low um, frequencies. Uh, the uh, the waveform can be as big as a football field, and uh, whereas millimeter wave um, can be millimeter wave uh, lengths are in measured in centimeters. So it depends on the frequency um, of the uh, material, the, the frequency that you're measuring the material with. But in general. You, you want you probably want to be about ten wavelengths away. Okay. Can I use this system when testing the signal efficiency between a transmitter and a receiver? Well, that's what the VNA is doing for you. Uh, you established a ratio on a two-port VNA. Um, when you measure those uh, antennas, the magnitude level that's telling you the efficiency. And uh, it, if your two antennas are matched to the center of the Smith chart in reflection of S11 and S22, and the, and the direction is correct, remember we talked about polarization, uh, whether it be vertical or horizontal, you want both those antennas to be the same. Um, for maximum uh, transfer of energy. In case you do not know the BW, how can you determine it? Could it be measured or calculated? Uh, yes, it can. Um, the most common way, uh, if you're trying to determine a device's frequency of operation and you don't have a technical data sheet or a model number, uh, you would um, uh, your first clue is going to be how the device is connectorized. So if you have a 3.5 millimeter connector, it's going to go max. It's not going to start to mode until after like 33 gigahertz. If you have 2.92 connector, um, you know that the maximum frequency is going to be uh, 40 gig. 
if you had a 1.85 millimeter, your maximum would be 70 gig, a one millimeter would be 110 gigahertz and so on. Um, so the first thing I would do is look at how it's connectorized because that's going to tell you what the top frequency is. And then um, you would uh, calibrate the VNA to sweep imagine you had a device you you didn't know what the frequency of operation was but it has 2.92 millimeter connectors on it so uh, you'd utilize a 40 gig uh, vector star VNA um, you would calibrate from 70 kilohertz to 40 gig um, perform that calibration and then connect the device to it. And whether you're looking at S11 or S21, if you have two connect, you know, two uh, connectors, depending on your measurement. Um, if you're looking at S11, where the frequency lands closest to the center of the Smith chart, that's the operating frequency of that device. And that's how you determine uh, what the bandwidth is. And you could back it off by, if you looked at it in log mag, you could back it off by 3 dB, you know, and that would tell you what your start and your stop is. Can you explain dithering or RF high immunity in the VNA? Um, well, dithering uh, has to do with, with averaging, which generally you don't, you're not going to utilize with the VNA. And what was the other part? RF high immunity. Uh, so RF immunity. So uh, each VNA and um, a lot of cables, uh, they have RF immunity from um, outside um, sources. But that's in regard to the instrument itself, the immunity the instrument itself has. Um, of course, if you're measuring an antenna and you're in an outdoor range and there's a lot of energy in the frequency range that you're measuring, you're going to have energy getting into your your measurement and you're, you're going to have to um, make adjustments for that. Okay. How does the length of the cable affect the measurement results? Well, it depends on, uh, oftentimes when you're measuring um, a cable and antenna um, and you can't disconnect them, uh, the cable obviously is part of your measurement. And the specification uh, that you're going to have for that combination is going to be cumulative in terms of swear. So, uh, you know, the cable is going to be part of your measurement. Um, in addition to the antenna, and that's very common. Okay. Does this webinar also apply for coaxial cables? Yes, it does. It 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 doesn't really matter um, what type of um, cable uh, could you could, could be waveguide. It could be coaxial, helix, all kinds of all kinds of different things. The principles are all the same. Okay, does having an antenna cable length too long matter when installing antennas? Well, you always want to be cognizant of the dynamic range of the VNA. Um, obviously, uh, if your uh, cable length has a, a large loss per foot and you can, you know, you, you could uh, quickly eat up the dynamic range of, of the VNA. So when you're selecting a VNA, that's one of the um, things to consider is how much dynamic range do I need for my measurement? And uh, oftentimes you'll find that many VNAs have 100 dB and sometimes greater um, in different frequency ranges. And that overcomes a very long cable length that has a great deal of loss per foot. But in general, you can get uh, pretty good distances, um, you know, in thousands of feet. Okay. Um, my last question here. Um, the phase shift, would it be different based on distance? And then the other part of this question is how does the VNA 
take care of the phase delay and group delay? Well, group delay is actually a measurement that you want to perform because you want to know um, how long it takes in terms of picoseconds for the signal to travel through that cable um, or material. Uh, that That's a very, very common measurement. Um, and can you repeat that question about yeah, the, the, phase, the phase part? The phase shift, would it be different based on distance? No, your 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 phase shift is not going to be different over time. Obviously, um, as the signal is propagating through uh, the material, the, the phase is constantly changing. Um, but if you have to perform um, a phase match of a cable, um, that can be done as well. Uh, you just simply uh, turn off wrapping um, in uh, on the VNA, and then if you turn your marker on and scroll the marker down, you'll have uh, basically a line descending in a 40, generally a 45 degree angle. And as you move the marker down that un unwrapped phase, um, it'll tell you the exact phase at at different frequencies. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Tom. Uh, that was it. Okay, great. Thank yeah. you. I appreciate it. Thank you. So on behalf of Ann Ritsu and our presenter, I want to thank you all for joining us today. This concludes our presentation. Have a great day. Goodbye.